Have you ever wondered just how much filtration you need in a fish tank? Today, we're gonna try to answer that question, so stay tuned. Hello everyone, this is Jason from Primetime Aquatics, and today we are going to be answering that age-old question, how much filtration do you actually need in your aquarium? Of course, we've got a couple different things that we have to consider. Thing number one is we wanna keep our fish happy and healthy, and we want the filtration that's going to allow that to happen. And the second thing is we wanna balance the cost. We don't wanna spend a lot more money than what's necessary, so in this video, we're gonna talk about how we can balance those two things, so stay tuned. Now before we get started, you should know I've got a lot of videos out on filtration. I think we've compared just about every type of filter that you can compare. We've looked at the nitrogen cycle, we've looked at how to lower ammonia and nitrites and nitrates in previous videos. I am going to put a lot of videos in the description below in case you want to get more information about different types of filtration, about the nitrogen cycle, about problems that can arise in water quality. So all of those videos will be in the description below. I highly recommend you check those out as well. Now, in order to understand how much filtration we need, we have to look at three different aspects of filtration. One, there is chemical filtration, the ability of filtration, really the media, to pull certain chemicals out of the water or at least neutralize them. The second thing is mechanical filtration. Mechanical filtration is the ability of a filter to pull out particulate matter in your water column. In other words, it's how clear the water looks. And the third thing is biological filtration, the ability of a filter to house bacteria that allow the nitrification cycle to happen in your aquarium, going from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. And of course, we've done videos on the nitrogen cycle before. I will put those in the description as well. All right, so we're gonna be looking at these three different types of filtration. I am going to start in descending order and we're gonna end with what I think is the most important type of filtration. So let's start with chemical filtration. The reason I list this first is I actually think it's probably out of the three, the least important of the three. When it comes to chemical filtration, we're talking about things like activated carbon or purigen. These components of filtration that will neutralize or pull things out of the water column. And so often when you're medicating tanks, they tell you to remove the carbon. Why? Because carbon will remove certain types of medications. Now the reason I place this first is a lot of people don't really even consider chemical filtration as part of the filtering process. And for the most part in the average setup that chemical filtration is not going to be a vital component of filtration in general. The second thing is mechanical filtration and this is the ability of a filter to pull out particulate matter from the water column, making the water appear cleaner and clearer. This is something I think a lot of people desire when they look at their fish tanks. They don't wanna see super cloudy, nasty, dirty water. However, when it comes to mechanical filtration, what we're really looking at here is a few things that's going to determine how clear your water is. Thing number one, the flow rate of the filter itself. How many times is the filter turning over the tank per hour? And so a standard for most aquarium hobbyists is they want that tank to be turned over roughly four to five times per hour. So in other words, if you've got a 20 gallon tank, you're probably gonna to want to filter that at least cycles that water that tank four or five times. So maybe you're gonna to want to filter somewhere in the 100 gallons per hour range. We have to be very careful here because while throughput is going to make a big difference in terms of pulling out the particulate matter, the more water you suck through the filter, the greater the opportunity for that particulate matter to get caught up in the filter media and not wind up back in the tank but there are some things that contribute to cloudy water. And this is where the debate really comes in in terms of water clarity. Bigger filters pull in more water, pull out more particulate matter, but the other thing you have to consider is the media inside that filter. If the media is very porous, it's going to allow more particulate matter to pass through the filter. If you've got filter pads in there with very small pores, you're gonna trap more particulate matter. But here's the thing, you can have a really great filtration system that is cycling water wonderfully. If you do not properly care for the filter media, it isn't going to matter. Once that filter media gets saturated with particulate matter, it isn't going to be able to trap additional particulate matter and it's just gonna wind up back in the tank. In our fish room, we can always tell whether it's a sponge filter or a hang on the back filter or a small canister filter. In every case, you begin to see changes in the way your tank looks when the filter media is saturated with detritus and fish waste and fish food, whatever else is floating around in the tank. So we wanna be looking at changing out, properly maintaining our filter media in any type of filter to maximize the clarity in our fish tanks. 
we also have to consider the types of fish that we're keeping. If you're going to be keeping fish that spend a lot of time interacting with the substrate, you're going to have additional particulate matter in the water column. So for instance, we keep a lot of geophagus here. They like to sift through sand, and as they do that, they kick up all kinds of stuff. Our plecos, our bristlenose plecos, they're pretty dirty fish. They will kick up lots of stuff in the water column. Our cichlids, a lot of them like to dig. Our shell dwellers love to stack sand in all kinds of different places. They're awesome, but every time you've got a fish that interacts with the substrate, there is an opportunity for that, whatever's in the substrate to go into the water column. Additionally, when you're choosing a filter, we have to be really careful about other factors when it comes to fish. So for instance, what if you've got a tank with a lot of fancy guppies, or angelfish, or severums, or a betta? These are the types of fish that really don't appreciate a lot of flow in a tank. And in fact, if you give them too much flow, they're going to get worn out and eventually they're going to die prematurely. So you really have to consider not only the fish that are going to be in your tank in terms of are they going to be at the bottom of the tank stirring stuff up, but other types of fish that really can't handle a large flow. I'll give you a really good example. As most of you know, the vast majority of our tanks are filtered by sponge filters. However, on a few tanks, so for instance, our Embuna tank, some of our Pleco tanks, the Oscar tank, and the new Geophagus 125, and the 150 on the other side of the fish room, there are some hang on the back filters on the backs of those tanks. Why? Strictly for mechanical filtration. A lot of the fish that we have in those tanks will either interact with the substrate or they have a heavy bio load, in which case there's gonna be a fair amount of particulate matter that's in the water column and I wanna remove that particulate matter. Now, for a Marine Land 350, I've got those on a 125. They're relatively cheap. Would they fit on a 20 long? Sure. Is it a good idea to put a Marine Land 350 on a 20 long? Depending on the fish, probably not. That is a lot of flow, over 300 gallons per hour. You're going to get a lot of water moving through that filter. And I bet you the water would probably look amazing. But whatever fish are in that 20 long are probably gonna be terrorized by the amount of water flow that's happening in that tank. So we have to be very careful to match the water flow to the types of fish that we're keeping. The other thing that we wanna consider when it comes to mechanical filtration is the stocking levels. If you've got a relatively sparsely stocked tank, you may not need as many gallons per hour to filter that tank. So I saved the best for last. I wanna talk about biological filtration. And this may be a little bit controversial to some of you, but I think this is where the vast majority of hobbyists waste a lot of money buying filtration they don't need, or at least too much filtration. What we have to understand about biological filtration, once again, it is the ability of a filter to move water through media, that media has surface area, and that surface area houses bacteria that complete the nitrification process, ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. What we also have to understand is every single surface in your aquarium, the plants, fake or real, the gravel or sand, any types of decorations, the glass itself, all of that is surface area, all of that is capable of housing the bacteria that go through the, ammonia, the nitrification process, ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. Now, I've already said, I think this is an area where a lot of people spend a lot of money to try to make sure that the nitrogen cycle is happening in their tank properly. And I also think it is an area where people spend a lot of unnecessary money. And I'd like to illustrate this with a few really clear examples. I have two 20 longs. Both of them are bristle nose breeding tanks. At one point in each tank, I had between 150 and 200 juvenile bristle nose plecos in those 20 logs. Here's my question to you. What do you think would be necessary to filter a tank like that? What would you put on it? Now I will show you what was on that tank. I never, ever, ever, not once, had an ammonia issue or a nitrite issue in that tank ever with over 150 bristlenose plecos and a 20 long. This, this little sponge filter. Give you an idea, size of my hand, average hand size. This is the only thing that I had on those bristlenose tanks for the entirety. And to this day, this is pretty much it. These little sponge filters were more than enough to ensure that the nitrification process was happening. Ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. Now, granted, there were some floating plants in there. 
We do have some wood. We do have a little bit of rock work at times. There is some sand. And what I said before still holds true. All of that surface area was also there to house bacteria to complete the nitrification process. So this thing was more than sufficient. The 40 gallon breeder that I have right now, at one point that had about 150 larger juvenile plecos in there along with some cichlids. And that too was primarily run by a sponge filter. I only added a hang on back for water clarity issues, mechanical filtration, but never had an issue with biological filtration. The 125 gallon Oscar tank, large Oscar, large Nile tilapia, lots of cichlids, all of them are stirring things up. Right now I've got three large sponge filters and a Marineland 350, Penguin 350 on that tank. I am absolutely certain I could remove the Marineland 350 and at least one of the sponge filters and never have an issue. I would never ever have an issue with the nitrification process, ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. The reason that Marineland is on there, the reason that third sponge filter is there is really for additional mechanical filtration. I want the water to look somewhat decent. I don't want to look at a super cloudy overrun tank. In all cases in our fish room, if there is a hang on the back filter on a tank, it is strictly for mechanical filtration, not because I am worried about biological filtration. Some of you may know Lucas from LRBAquatics.com, great guy. He, he is in the business of maintaining a very, very large fish room. He breeds fish, he sells them. He's got an awesome YouTube channel. I will put his channel in the description below because I think it's an important thing to see. I asked him the other day, with hundreds of tanks, I knew he was getting away from the traditional filtration. I asked him, how many tanks are you running right now with just air? And the overwhelming majority, the vast majority of the tanks that he has are run either by air, and what I mean by that is an air stone with no actual fil traditional filter, or with a power head. How is that working? How is somebody who's got all these tanks, and really that's his livelihood, trusting everything to air stones and power heads? The reason? Because he understands that biological filtration happens with surface area and the proper amount of oxygen. As long as bacteria, the bacteria that complete the nitrification process, are getting oxygen, they're going to be able to go through the ammonia to nitrite to nitrate process and the need for a filter, a dedicated filter, may not be as important as we are traditionally taught. Now, I'm not saying run out, take all your filters out of your tanks and everything's going to be fine. What I am saying is one, when you've got a, a seasoned tank, a, a well-established tank that's been running for a number of months or years or more, the surface area on all those tanks have probably coated with bacteria that's going to complete the nitrification process. The second thing is, if you've got a large, heavily stocked tank, yeah, you're not going to want to run out and just throw some air stones in there and be like, oh, yeah, it should be fine, and then run into an issue. What I am saying is that when it comes to biological filtration, we often filter far more than what is necessary. What we have to understand about biological filtration, of the three that I've talked about, if we get this wrong, fish die. If we miss the chemical filtration, that may not be the most important thing. If we miss the mechanical filtration, the tanks might not look great, but the fish are probably going to be okay. If we screw up biological filtration and we've got ammonia or nitrite in the tank, that is a huge issue. The good news is that's a little bit harder to screw up than you might think in a well-established tank. Now, again, when we're talking about biological filtration, it isn't just the filters that are contributing to that process, that nitrification process. If you've got live plants in your tank, that is going to be a major factor. Plants are gonna be able to help us manage nitrogen a lot easier than not having live plants. The other thing that you're gonna to wanna to consider when it comes to filtration is redundancy. Before we ran sponge filters and we just ran hang on the backs, my preference was to run two smaller hang on the back filters on a tank as opposed to one large one. Why? Because if one of the filters goes down, I have a backup that's already fully cycled, that's already running. I can take my time running out to the store, maybe the day after or the day after that, and get a, a second hang on the back filter when I want to. If you only have one filter, we have a much larger problem because now the bacteria, if they're not having that water flow, they're starting to die off. You don't have any water movement. You don't have any oxygen going into the tank because of that water movement and things can get pretty bad pretty quick. So redundancy is probably a good thing. I would opt for two smaller filters as opposed to one larger one. It's also the reason why with our sponge filters, I often have multiple sponge filters in some of our larger tanks. Why? Because I'd like to be able to pull that sponge filter out 
and put it in a new tank if I want to, and then I can replace the sponge filter with a new one in the old tank. Now, obviously, when it comes to the size of a filter you need for biological filtration, there are a lot of things that you have to think about. The number of fish that you're keeping, the amount of waste that they produce, the types of foods that you're feeding. If you've got large South American cichlids packed in a tank, you're probably gonna want more filtration for the biological side than if you've got a 125 gallon filled with guppies and there's a ton of plants, maybe some quarries and you know a couple angelfish. That might be a different story. All right, so if we were to summarize everything in terms of the size of the filter that you choose, Thing number one, if mechanical filtration is important to you, then you're gonna to want to at least turn that water over in the tank four to five times per hour. So if you've got a 40 gallon breeder, you're gonna to wanna to choose something that's gonna get you between 160 and 200 gallons per hour, ideally. If you cover that, if you've got that covered, chances are the media that's in that filter is gonna be more than sufficient to cover your biological filtration because from that perspective, you probably don't need quite that much. Now this is all assuming that you're gonna have a well-established tank and that the media in that tank is already going to be cycled or that you're doing a fishless cycle before you add the fish. All right, everybody, so hope it gives you something to think about. If you enjoyed this video, share, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.